Hey. Oh, are you what? Inter ah, well, it, we're in low Earth orbit, you know, that's pretty damn close. Um, so if, you know, I, I'm curious, who, who was old enough in the late 80s or 90s to realize what was going on in the world? Um, and, you know, uh, no one? No, no one's showing up? Put your, put your hand up. Like, in 1989, did you understand something of global politics or not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so if, if, you, if, if you were, you were probably subjected to, like, this, this you know, sort of, like, inane... Um, uh, position that history was ending, history had ended, you know, communism fell, uh, liberal democracy was taking over, free markets everywhere, um, the entire world would now be, you know, reasonably managed by, you know, management consultants, um, everything's gonna, gonna be fine and progress forever. Um, it turned out that, you know, um, well, first, like, if, if you weren't, like, in, you know, a, a global minority, um, uh, country, that, that, that things didn't really work entirely that way. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you had regional conflicts. Well, it didn't matter because it's regional, right? That's not, that's not real, right? If you happen to be there, well, that kind of sucks, but, uh, you know, um, not, not such a big deal, but, um, I also find that, that it, it's really interesting how today's, like, uh, AI shilling, is also about like how history it, it has you know ended. It's just like now that we have LLMs, they're just gonna like self improve, and then you know profit. I guess I don't know something something profit, right? It, they 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 just won't stop. It's the end of history. Everything's cool. Um, but you know, I think that the reason people have come here and the reason we had tracks like you know on human rights and you know climate resilience decentralized justice that kind of stuff is because the folks who come here know that history hasn't ended they kind of noticed that not everything is perfectly right um and you know at the end of the day i think a lot of what brings people here is not because um replacing a you know stable proven uh, efficient protocol with you know some kind of like random stuff we invented um and that crashes a bit uh, is fun um it's because we're we're actually interested in using technology to contribute to making the world better and i don't know about you but like personally i find innovation quite boring you know call me when we're crossing the justice chasm um that might be um that might be a little bit more interesting and so the question though is like is it working like are we are we winning you know, do do we feel that the th the stuff that we're doing is like making a dent or making a difference I'm not entirely sure, but you know, <laughs> so, sorry, man. <laughs> I, I can't have memes on every fucking slide, right? <laughs> the question is, what, <laughs> what does winning look like? <laughs> What does winning look like? Well, a lot of us, you know, not just B5, a lot of us tend to believe that winning is user agency, right? It's, it's, you know, we, we, we find that people are constrained in the world. Um, and we figure out that something around user agency has to be the answer, but it's not clear to me that we've exactly figured out how to operationalize that. And in fact, we had a good conversation about that. I think we should keep having conversations about that. Um, at, at, at heart, you know, user agency, uh, you could say that people have agency when they are the authors of their lives and the co-authors of their collective existence, right? They have a say in, in, in the world around them, in the constraints around them. Okay, that's, you know, beginning of a definition. Maybe we can, can, can we operationalize that? You know, can we go home afterwards? Um, I think one of the, the things that's interesting in that notion is that if you think of, like, the idea of being an author of your own life, then you enter, like, this, this, like, interesting uh, semantic zone of authors authority and to authorize and it turns out that well we've made technology that kind of maps to that right we have like the idea of user user agency and when you have a cid the cid gives you authority over content you don't need to to ask someone else's authority it's not like you know those uh, hierarchical location based schemes hannah had a, a a good part of a talk about that um and also we have you cans that you know allow you to authorize someone um and i think that's a lot 
of what um, IPFS centers around is like shifting authority and ideally shifting authority primarily um, to people. But, you know, inventing a protocol means you've solved the problem, right? That's, that's how it works. Like, so we, we, we have all the bricks. We have all the user agency that like, let's have a beer. Let's have a beer, make a token, do, do an ICO, go home. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, no, that's bullshit, actually. Um, <laughs> it, it, it actually, it, actually when, 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 you know, we tend to have this thing as technologists um, that, that we imagine that, you know, basically individual responsibility is like the thing that drives the world and that once you've solved the problem as like a computer genius, well, that problem is solved, right? Um, and deployment is probably someone else's problem. Um, we can't really work that way. And in fact, computers have turned out to be spectacularly bad at liberating people and at creating user agency. There's this great quote from Weizenbaum um, before I was born, who already knew that things were fucked up that way. And yet, you know, over the, I've been born, what, like 30 years or something like that? Oh, over the past 30 years, <coughs> um, since 77, um, uh, that, 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 you know, we, we still haven't really solved that problem. We still haven't addressed the fact that basically we've primarily used computers to re-encode power structures. And again, like folks, like the, the people in this room really want that to change. And we all have ideas about how to change bits and pieces of it, but there doesn't seem to be like a systematic way to do it. And we don't seem to be meeting with, you know, success that correlates with the level of effort that we're putting into it. And so, there's this paper from David Clark. If you haven't heard of David Clark, he's you know one of the internet OGs. Uh, you might have heard the the, the, the 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 sentence "rough consensus and running code." That's him. That's something someone actually invented that. Um, and he's been writing. Um, you know, he's not one of those internet graybeard who just turns into a cantankerous um, asshole. Uh, he's actually been. Uh, writing a lot of um, very interesting things about about how the internet could be different, how how power works, how control structures work, and so this diagram is kind of ugly as it gets, but I think there's there's an interesting there's an interesting thing to his approach. He wrote this paper called Control Point Analysis, and basically this diagram shows um, all the steps, and it's not even all the steps, but it's it's ideally kind of an ideal version of all the steps involved in a person retrieving a web page just once. This is just one interaction, and so you start from the user start, and you go down the the the, the blue boxes there, and also someone needs to have created the web page on the other side, and it's actually more complicated than that. But every red bubble is a point of control, and so what he does is he looks at the flow to accomplish one action, a single task, and looks at every single place that someone will have some degree of control over the process. And of course, like it's, it's, a, it's you know, largely a waterfall thing. So if you control one step, you don't control the entire thing necessarily. You can stop it. It doesn't mean you can influence every bit, but like you have some control um, over it. And I think this, this kind of analysis shows us the work that we need to be doing. You know, this is basically if you, you know, if you somehow liberate one of the things, but like everything above it and everything under it is, is, is captured, then you've essentially achieved very little. Um, and that is why I think mapping things out that way and understanding how we get to agency from there um, is actually an interesting exercise and something that we should be thinking about. Because for every single red um, box in there, we basically have, you know, this exact dynamic. It's a very simple dynamic. It only takes two arrows, right? Um, but you have control over a control point. You have power there and you use that to extract rent. And then you use the rent you've extracted to finance greater control. And then you can use that rent to like gain control over, over other parts. And, you know, so long as we don't basically seize back control lower the rent, but still be able to capture enough value to finance continued control over that thing, nothing's going to change. There is one alternative, which is go like, oh, this is really complicated. You know, we can't really gain back control over everything. That was just like loading one web page. There's a whole other, other bunch of other things that people will do with computers, right? Um, and so you can go off and like invent your own protocol that's not compatible with anything and that just sits to the side and does its own thing in, in its own corner and has its own parallel universe that maybe gets funding and all that, which is sort of what, you know, hippies tried to do at some point. The problem is, well, you never get the rest of society to join you 
because you smell a little bit, to be honest. Um, and also you starve at the first winter, which is what happened to most of these communes. Um, <laughs> it's true. And so I think like, you know, instead of doing that, we really need to be figuring out how to approach every single one of those control points. And instead of like, you know, a lot of us and myself included, like I'm definitely not pointing fingers here, or like, you know, maybe pointing fingers like that, um, have tended over the years to think like, oh, I can take this box, I can solve this box, and then freedom, right? Uh, but again, if you only solve like inside one box, you're not going to succeed. And so that means like building bridges to other people. And that is why, you know, it's really good to have here inside of the same conference, people working on web stuff, people working on climate stuff, people working on human rights and justice, etc. because we need to figure out how to plug all of these things together, uh, you know, without necessarily having a master plan, but at least having like shared ideas of how it works. And you know, a lot of what that entails is that instead of like going to found like a hippie commune with like our own protocols and, and, you know, uh, you know, blackjack and hookers and whatever have you, um, we, we need to go where people are. We need to be meeting people's needs directly and we need to be making stuff that works for people. Um, and that's, you know, I think, I mean, a lot of presentations this week have been about it precisely that. I think there's like a coherent movement in that direction. I think that is basically what we need to, 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 to encourage further. And so at the end of the day, um, I really think that, that, you know, we tend to show, to make fun of this cat, you know, Baffy the cat. Um, I love Baffy the cat. But, you know, in the same way that Camus tried to imagine Sisyphus uh, happy, uh, Sisyphus happy, I think we should imagine, um, um, you know, Baffy the cat happy because he has a spiritual home and user agency, you know, it's, and it's wonderful. Thank you very much.